Good afternoon. Welcome to the Johns Hopkins School of Education, Doctor of Education virtual webinar. My name is Sion John. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions. Also here with me, I'm my colleague from the Office of Admissions and she will introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya McMillan. I'm an admissions coordinator here at the School of Education. Thank you so much for joining us today. And also presenting today, we have a current student of the EDD program, Amanda Palmer, and faculty lead of the Doctor of Education program, Dr. Carrie Prokoski. And before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. Also, please take a shot. Please take a second to see if your mic is on mute and video is off right now. Please have your mic on mute and video off at all times during the presentation. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please type your question in the chat box and we will answer your questions. Next, I would like to share the agenda for today's presentation. We will kick off the presentation sharing an overview of the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Then Dr. Prokoski will go over the program details of the EDD program. We also have a current student of the EDD program and she will talk about her journey here at SOE. And lastly, we'll cover admissions requirements and financial aid and leave the floor open for questions at the end. And to start, we are one of nine schools at Johns Hopkins University. We began offering college courses for teachers in 1909 and then became our own school in 2007. We are proud to share that the Johns Hopkins School of Education is consistently ranked one of the top schools in education by the US News and World Report. And for school enrollment, we have approximately 2,367 students and offer 27 graduate programs, which includes doctoral, master's, and graduate certificate programs. And we also have a strong network of over 22,000 SOE alums. And for faculty introduction, Dr. Carrie Borkowski is an associate professor and the faculty lead for the Doctor of Education program. Dr. Borkowski joined faculty in 2016. She received her PhD at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and her EDD here at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Dr. Borkowski's research focus is cultivating connection, community, and belonging in our learning spaces. And lastly, Dr. Prokofsky received the JHU SOE Teaching Award in 2019, the Bloomberg School of Public Health Excellence and Teaching Award in 2016, and Faculty Award for Service Learning in 2015. And at this time, I am going to hand the floor over to Dr. Prokofsky and she will be presenting on the Doctor of Education program. Great, thank you so much, Sian, and welcome everybody. It's uh, so good to have you here with us. Just to start us off, it's a reminder of the program vision and mission. Um, the vision involves, you know, tackling those complex educational problems that you're facing in your own context and reading about either in articles or listening to on the in your news sources. Um, we really try to attract and prepare scholar practitioners who consider social justice issues um, that, of course, lead to and contribute to change within educational contexts. In terms of the mission. We are really trying to cultivate and build skills and knowledge in scholar practitioners across the world. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that we have a diverse, uh, diverse student body, which is wonderful. Um, our students examine educational problems of practice well, with reliance on their expertise as practitioners. So the expertise that you bring into the program coupled with the program that we offer involving you know, multiple perspectives, systems thinking, improvement science, design thinking, methodology, and of course, social justice, as I mentioned, and it's all in service of really improving and contributing to better educational outcomes. Now, in terms of, you know, who for whom is this degree ideal? I think Amanda's gonna talk to you a little bit more about this later. Um, it's, it's really for experienced practitioners who want to build on their current knowledge and expertise, as well as their skill set, um, And it really permits uh, these individuals to examine real world problems of practice when they 
create powerful interventions and other strategies and ideas based on evidence and research um, informing us about what works and this ability to rigorously evaluate change and also critically um, you know, look at and consume the research um, that, that's made. In terms of the program itself, and much of this information is on our website, um, but just to recap. So, you know, like many doctoral programs, our program requires 90 graduate credits. Now, keep in mind that, you know, our students come in with master's degrees, so that counts toward the degree, and you can see up to 36 credits can transfer. And then there's an additional potential, um, and this is more detail that we can talk about later if there are questions, for six additional credit hours to come in. So at a minimum, our students must complete 48 credit hours um, within the Hopkins ecosystem. In terms of specializations, again, there are details and faculty leads listed on our website, but it continues to be entrepreneurial leadership, our mind, brain, and teaching, instructional design and online teaching and learning, and urban leadership. Um, I do want to note for individuals who are currently or who have been in our mind, brain, and teaching certificate, if you do enter or get accepted to the doctorate of education, we, we will ask you to select a different specialization because there's a lot of overlap in the certificate and those specialization courses. So just to keep that in mind. In terms of features, um, it should be no surprise that you know Johns Hopkins, the expectation at the School of Education is a high level of rigor and excellence. Um, we strive to make the, the articles you're reading, the work you're doing relevant, um, and also we promote and, and try to cultivate powerful change, which can take the form of intervention and other, other things that our students do. Most of our students complete probably within the three to four, you know, four year range. We do have students that take a little bit longer, but those are sort of extenuating circumstances. The instruction is asynchronous. It's online. We do have some synchronous activities, um, but these are, are optional. So just keep in mind that we are an online asynchronous program. And additionally, the culminating project for our doctoral students is what we refer to as a doctoral dossier, and that will be taken up or embedded in the coursework, as well as some additional courses that you'll take specifically around doctoral research. In terms of structure, um, the, we have multiple credits, 12 credits in the Foundations of Education, we also require that students take research methods classes, so that that would be three credits, uh, sorry, three courses and nine credits. So it's research methods one and two, and then students take what we call a program evaluation course. Then we already talked about that specialization area, and typically that's about 12 credits plus some electives. And then the doctoral dossier really represents the work you will do around that culminating project, and it's really your, your own, you know, independent research. Now, in terms of transition points, and this might be a little bit different than what you've heard in other graduate degrees. So as a doctoral student, we have different moments in the program to sort of check on, you know, your progress and your competencies. So in our program, we have something after the first year, we have something called a year one paper, which is really just demonstrating that you've had the ability to examine factors related to the problem of practice. At the end of your second year, after you've finished a series of courses, um, you will sit for what we call the comprehensive exam. It is oral and it focuses solely on your core courses that you take. Then like most all doctoral programs, you will both um, defend a proposal for the, the work that you wanna do. And then at the end of the program or towards the end, you will have a final defense of the work that you completed. Now, in terms of the doctoral dossier, so this is our culminating project for our doctoral students. It really is um, described as, um, you know, th two to three independently completed but closely interrelated projects. Um, projects, as I've already said, are embedded within coursework and really are distributed across the three years. So this is why our students are able to finish in three to four years because you're doing coursework and that culminating project concurrently. Um, again, the focus continues to be on a deep dive into that problem of practice, both through the academic literature as well as empirical data. So whether it's primary or secondary data, 
And the, the goal here at the end, of course, is we want our students to have opportunities to contribute to significant change within the context of their professional practice or perhaps implications for policy at the local state and maybe even national or international level. In terms of support structures, I have to say I'm um, particularly proud of the way in which our program and faculty support our students. And I hope Amanda will speak to this a little bit later. We really do pride ourselves and focus a lot on the student experience. As you might imagine, being an online student from all over the world can feel isolating at times. And so we really do intentionally create spaces and structures to help facilitate our students learning, but also your development as human beings, as professionals, and as doctoral students. So these support structures include things like an online orientation that happens the summer before you, you enter the program in the fall. We do have a yearly residence, and in the past, it's been a face-to-face -face orientation, and you can imagine with the pandemic, we've had to shift gears and bring that online, um, hoping, fingers crossed, you can't see me, but fingers crossed that we can return to face-to-face -to -face soon. We also have what we call a faculty cohort lead. So for years one, two, and three, we currently have a faculty that really just helps to guide and be a, another resource for students moving through that particular part of the program. There are faculty advisors and instructors. Um, additionally, you work with um, you know, multiple faculty through your courses to refine the, the culminating project. Um, we also have uh, a few years ago, we implemented a writing clinic, which is just another great resource. We have amazing librarians who are there to help you with things, you know, it, it may seem simple to do a search on your topic, and sometimes it can be quite tricky to figure out the right words, the right databases, and so we're really lucky to have folks like um, Sharon Morris and others helping us with that. And then we have lots and lots of online resources um, through our learning management system. And as I mentioned, we do have a mandatory online orientation. So once you've applied, we've gone through the admission cycle. And you know, if you receive a letter of acceptance and you choose to join um, our community, really as early as May, um, the cohort lead would reach out to that new cohort to make some connections, some introductions, and prepare you for that summer of work. And these are the sections of how the online orientation is organized, um, just to give you a taste. So some of it is really just acclimating our students to an online setting, the learning management system, and then some of them, as you can see, um, you know, the library section, section two is introduction to research. So some of it is taking a little bit of a, a dive, maybe a dip is a better word, a dip into the pool of what you'll be um, getting into during the year. So. And then again, I, I also mentioned that every year in the middle of uh, the summer about around, it's like right after um, the US 4th of July, um, we have orientation. Now, the last two years have been um, online. It's been a couple of days of online activities. And um, I know for folks who aren't as familiar with online learning, that might sound like a drag. Um, I will, I'm happy to report that it's actually been a lot of fun. And it's amazing what you can do when you get some, some people in the room who really know what they're doing. Um, we are all crossing our fingers that we will get to go back to face-to-face. -to -face, um, and that is just Oh, I have to say that's probably my most favorite part of the program is getting to meet all of you. Um, the residency does happen, as I say, each year. It's usually it's usually about two and a half days. So you could imagine if it's face to face, uh, students come in on two. Uh, sorry, Sunday. We do think Sunday evening, and then programming is Monday and Tuesday. Um, again, it allows uh, program your specific learning. So the sessions are really geared towards creating study sessions and scaffolding. Um, to get you prepared for what's coming in the fall. And, um, and, on, and honestly, it's just a really great time to, to build those connections and relationships with faculty and other students. In terms of um, past research studies, honestly, our research studies are as diverse as our students. And these are just a few examples of what our students have done. So you can see example-based learning in the Arabian Gulf. <clears throat> excuse me, there's been HIV, AIDS, infected young adults, 
um, non-adherence to medication, um, education for diversity, and how to think about teacher success in terms of connecting with culturally and linguistically diverse populations, entrepreneurship in Brazil, um, self-regulated learning in an independent school, advisement models, and then you can see partnership models um, in terms of business and education. So they really do run the gamut in our program, which um, is, is super fun from a faculty standpoint. Sherry, can I jump right in? Yeah, I um, I, yes, please I will go ahead and introduce yourself really quickly and talk about your, um, your work, Amanda. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here and talk to you. Uh, my name is, I'm proud to say Dr. Amanda Palmer. Um, I am recently defended uh, my dissertation. So I'm from the 2018 cohort. Um, when it did look a little different towards the end. So rather than a dossier at the time, we, we um, were doing a full dissertation. Um, but so much of the rest of this program is, is exactly the same. So hopefully I can talk to you just a little bit about um, why, you know, why to enter this kind of program. And then specifically for me, why I selected uh, Hopkins over some of the other programs that I found out there. Um, and Carrie mentioned this a little bit too, but I think one of the things for me as a practicing educator was that I kept seeing some of those same problems to use the language of the program problems in practice happening over and over again and happening in specific places and feeling like my knowledge was sort of hitting a, a standstill and my ability to do something about those problems to really focus on, on providing solutions to those problems was sort of hitting a wall. And this was a great space where I could actually target that problem, understand the problem first, and then really develop something to, to actually do, right? So that actionable step that we want to take rather than a lot of informed people sitting around a table and talking about the problem, right? How can we, how can we learn about it and then do something about it that's actionable? Um, and this program very much uh, keeps you in that, that lane of really deeply understanding something so that you can impact change. And what I loved about this program in particular, so to shift a little bit to Hopkins, was that we really do that within our professional context. And so for me, being able to target, to understand my context where I'm teaching currently so deeply and, and really develop something that I could see change has been very successful. So you'll see here, my problem of practice is variances in teacher knowledge and self-efficacy with culturally responsive teaching practices. So I had the opportunity to study that problem um, and then work with a group of 20 faculty here at my school to really look at and target their self-efficacy and their knowledge in that space and, and change it and help it. Um, and I'm seeing already some actionable changes here, which is fantastic. I'm looking kind of forward uh, to, to see how that will play out. Um, just to highlight some of those pieces that Carrie talked about, the reasons for choosing Hopkins here, you'll see I loved the combination of the synchronous and asynchronous. Um, we're all living very busy lives, um, and many of us are, you know, in very, very different time zones across the world. Uh, so it was wonderful to be able to learn from so many different people doing so many different things in so many different research areas, but feel like we were learning together. And the way that Hopkins balances those synchronous and asynchronous opportunities um, really, really hit that in a way that I appreciated. Um, also, our dissertation research, so the, the uh, dossier work was, was linked into our professional context, and that helped me feel very engaged in my dissertation work as a practicing educator. And that felt very good to be really applying what I was learning in class to my practice and vice versa. And that was supported and encouraged. So it all felt very, very relevant rather than me feeling like I was in you know, two different lanes. Um, Hopkins also talks quite a lot about practitioners and scholars and that shift from a scholar practitioner to a practitioner scholar. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much airtime on that because I want to make sure we've got time for questions at the end too. Um, but it was just very important to me that I found a program where the faculty recognized that my priority in, in my case was less so just studying the depth of the problem, but also sort of a yes and, right? Also really being in the space, being with students in my case, being with other teachers and other faculty. And that that was a focus of the program, that was a focus of our assignments, that was a focus of our readings, um, was that we were really both practicing as well as studying. Um, then also in the case, especially of my, um, of my research topic. So as a white practitioner working in a space um, that is 
in my case right now, predominantly a white institution as well. Um, I was really looking for a, an institution that was not predominantly white, just to be very frank about that. And the diversity that we have of the teaching faculty, both racially, um, experientially, uh, just across all of these sort of the big, the big eight identifiers, um, that was really important for me. And I found that Hopkins really intentionally um, gave us access to a variety of professionals that we could seek advice from and help from and learn from. Um, some of the other highlights I've sort of touched on these. So our relationship with the professors, Carrie mentioned the, the multitude of support systems. Um, and I found that this program really specifically supported those connections and that bridge building between our professors, um, the people that we're learning with, right? So who we sometimes call colleagues, sometimes classmates, sometimes learners, and then as well, the committee members. So the people who are really helping you push through that final project at the end. Um, my relationship with all of these professors was uh, one that was very close. It was very transparent. Um, our professors want us to succeed, but also hold you to a really high standard. So it, it really did make me feel like I was in an active program that was taking a lot of brain power, but also with very high results, right? Also really changing the way that I, I think about things. Um, comparably that application to coursework to what I was saying before, really working in that, and in this case, the dossier uh, project into the professional work and into your coursework. So the folding of those three made every assignment feel relevant. And I did not feel like there was sort of the, the busy work to be doing busy work because this was a doctoral program, right? It felt very applicable and real and, and intentionally chosen. Um, I was asked to give a couple of tips too and so if this is the program that you're leading for, um, I received this advice in, in my orientation, that first orientation that we had, which was digitize, digitize, digitize. And I am very much a paper planner person. I am someone who prints things and likes to scribble all over them and highlight. And I received this advice very early on in the program, um, thinking, frankly, that I was going to sort of dismiss it. And it was the best advice that I received. So like I said, so much of this program is really intentionally selected and integrated. And there's a lot of space for you to be intentionally selecting your own um, outside resources and references. And it was really helpful for me the longer I got in the program to have those things digitized in some capacity so that I could search pretty quickly. You know, everybody loves a good control F. That was just a really helpful tip. And then also to trust the professors and the process. Um, I'm somebody, I will be very transparent, who has very, very high test anxiety. So the idea of an oral comprehensive exam was very intimidating to me. Uh, and I, I felt like it was, um, something that was perhaps going to be a prohibitive barrier for me. And I kept being told to trust, trust the process, trust the process, and they were right. <laughs> um, it was the, the whole experience, each of those big hurdles um, was, you know, felt, felt like something to get over. But on the other side, it's just really, really impacted not only my, ultimately my work, but also my, my dissertation work, but also the way that I'm interacting and engaging with people in a professional space, people at conferences. Um, it's really helped me not only engage at a different level, but also understand things at a different level. So the number of times my, my professors and my committee members laugh at me because I'll be sitting and listening to a lecture and start citing things in my mind, right? So the, the connections and the rewiring of your brain that happens in this program is really invigorating, really, really invigorating. And so to just sort of trust that cumulative process. So again, apologies for talking so quickly. I'm trying to get a lot in in a short period of time. But um, if, if I had to give, you know, just three, let's say three major takeaways here. Um, I would say that one of the best parts of this program was really that that connection building, that network of support that they, that is provided by the program, by the professors, by, as Carrie mentioned, the librarians, especially just by so many elements of this program, um, both before, during, and, and then as well as after. So the connections that I'm maintaining with professors after the fact is, um, is really helpful and, and pushing me and makes me feel like I made the right choice with this program. Um, and also just the, the ability that I, I had to learn new techniques that I'm able to, to bring in to new writing techniques, new research techniques, new, um, at the simplest level, new presentation programs and presentation techniques that I'm able to bring into multiple areas of my, my life has been fantastic. 
Um, and then lastly, I think that the idea of the practitioner scholar and scholar practitioner is, is the one that really has hit home for me in this program. Um, it's molded the way I think. It makes me take research and bring it into real time space. It makes me take real time space and bring it into research. Um, that's just been a huge takeaway. So I'm here for questions. Carrie, hopefully I didn't leave anything out. Let me know if I did. <laughs> I thought it was great. I thought it was great, Amanda. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. Of course, of course. Thank you so much, Amanda and Dr. Burkowski. So now we'll continue by going over the application requirements. Applicants must submit a completed application, which can be found on our website. Also, keep in mind there is an $80 application fee. However, uh, we are waiving the application fee for those that do submit their application by December 16. Next, you will need an updated resume highlighting your educational and professional background. Your personal statement should not exceed more than 750 words describing a problem of practice relevant to your current context of professional practice. Be sure to align your problem of practice with one of our four specialization areas. Moving on, you should also submit three letters of recommendation. These letters should include at least the following, a professor you've worked with in your master's program who can speak on your competency to conduct rigorous scholarly work, and a professional recommender who can attest your qualifications to pursue a doctorate degree, and this recommender would support your problem of practice. Keep in mind that you're able to submit three professional references if you are not able to have an academic reference. One final note is to make sure one of your professional recommendations is your executive sponsor. Your executive sponsor should be someone who will be an asset in helping you gain access to data and or participants related to your problem of practice. If you are self-employed, your executive sponsor might be a person of authority with agency you would like to work with to collect your related data to earning your doctorate degree. Applicants are required to identify and submit the name of an executive sponsor within their online application form as well. Next, the GRE is not a requirement for admissions consideration to our EDB program. It is, an option, it is an option for an applicant to submit a GRE test score as part of their application. However, submitting a GRE test score is an opportunity for you to present additional evidence of the quantitative and verbal skills required for a doctoral level study. Also, official transcripts, excuse me, are required. We do require all transcripts, including institutions where you may have taken courses, but did not earn a degree. Again, this will be from all post-secondary institutions that you may have attended. Lastly, all applicants will be asked to complete a virtual interview upon submitting their application. Also, Dr. Batowski, we do uh, receive a good amount of questions relating to the problem of practice and executive sponsor and admissions. In addition to what I just shared, uh, please feel free to share any additional insider information on the problem of practice and executive sponsor. Yeah, sure. We do. Um, Tanya, you're right. We get so many questions about the executive sponsor. And I guess the tip that I would give, since Amanda was giving all sorts of tips, the tip that I would give is um, don't overthink this. You really want to find someone in your organization who, you know, I like to describe this person, Tanya, as your champion and the person who's going to be supportive, who's going to be able to open doors to help you send that email that's going to connect you with, you know, potential participants um, and also has sort of inside scoop on your context and your professional organization. This is not someone who sits on your um, committee or a faculty panel that would be reviewing your research. So it doesn't have to be that kind of a person. It really has to be the person that brings that contextual expertise and is in your court when it comes to your research. That's that's truly fundamental. In terms of the problem practice, um, the thing over the years, the, the thing I've learned to share, Tanya, that I feel like resonates most with, with current students and perspectives is, imagine if I were to walk into your context, whatever that space is, whether it's a boardroom, a classroom, you know, a building. And if I walked in and you were giving me, you were my tour guide, the tour guide of your POP, 
what would you point out? What would you describe? What would it feel like? What would it sound like? What would it look like? A problem of practice is not the absence of something. The problem of practice is something that's going on in that context that in some, some cases is driving you crazy. So what is it that is going on that might be that problem of practice? So, so that's what I would share, Tanya. Thanks so much, Dr. Bukowski. Tanya, I'm happy to jump in with my examples if you want as well. Oh, sure. If you'd like to share some, that'd be fine. Sure, sure. So my, in my case, my executive sponsor, I work at an independent school on the East Coast, and my executive sponsor was my head of school. Um, and so she was someone who I, I knew prior to asking her was very supportive of me continuing my education. She um, had a lot of shared interests with me. And as Carrie said, she was the one who was would be able to open doors for me. She would be able to co-sign emails as I sent them out asking for participants within my context. Um, and I had, she ended up leaving the institution. So also the director of psychology is somebody who has a lot of power within the institution uh, and was somebody who was really interested in my problem of practice as well. And so again, to Carrie's point, they were not on my committee. They were not reviewing my research. They were people within my context that were able to say, yes, we're standing behind her. And we think that this is a good use of the institution's time. We would like our teachers to participate. Um, hopefully that helps. Thanks so much for sharing that, Amanda. Appreciate that. So for our admissions timeline, the EDD application is open for fall 2022 admission currently. You'll be able to find the application on our school's website. The application deadline is January 14, 2022. Any supporting materials, for example, your official transcripts, letters of recommendation, virtual interview, must be fully submitted and completed by January 14. From that time, applications will be reviewed from February to mid-March, and admissions decisions will be released via email in mid-March 2022. There are a few additional steps that you'll need to take in order to complete the application process if you are an international student. Non-US citizens from countries where English is not the official language are required to submit one of the following standardized tests as a part of the application process. A waiver for the English language proficiency requirement may be granted for some applicants who meet specific criteria. Information on the English language testing waiver can be found on the school's website under the International Student Admissions page. Also, please note if you hold qualifying degrees or have earned credits from institutions outside of the United States, you must have your academic records evaluated by an accredited independent credential evaluation agency before you can be considered for admission to the EDD program. Again, you may find additional information on our school's website under the International Student Admissions page. Here on this slide, we have a breakdown of the tuition fees uh, for the program, it is 1638 uh, per credit. We also encourage you to uh, view our tuition and fees page on the website as well. Um, we'll be sending this chart uh, in a thank you email with the recorded video within one week after the event is complete as well. If you're interested in applying for financial aid, we do strongly encourage you to apply for financial aid when you start your online application for the EDD program. Our EDD program also offers scholarships that range from $500 to $2,000 per semester. Students do not need to apply for these scholarships. These EDD partial scholarships are merit-based and are awarded to select students by the EDD admissions committee. Lastly, the School of Education also offers a limited number of partial need-based institutional scholarships each year. SOEs and Dow scholarship awards range on average from $500 to $1,500 per semester and are applied to tuition expenses beginning in the fall semester. To see if you qualify to apply for the Endowed Scholarship, please visit the Grants and Scholarship page on the school's website. We'll now open the floor up to any questions that you may have. Please uh, type your questions in the Q&A area on the uh, screen there. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Tanya. I'll kick us off with the first question that I'm seeing. It says, will you accept four letters of recommendation? Each recommender represents a unique perspective on my background and experience. Uh, so the EDD program, we have a requirement of no more than three letters of recommendation. Again, this is just out of fairness for the other, uh, other applicants. And please keep in mind out of the three, one should be your executive sponsor. The next question we have is, can you speak a little more about how the program makes synchronous learning opportunities available? And that one is for Dr. Burkowski and um, Amanda as well. Yeah, sure. So um, there's multiple ways that the program makes these synchronous learning, um, learning available. So each course in the program sort of, not sort of, but does build in two to three synchronous sessions across the sem semester where you may come together to discuss articles you're reading, assignments that are going on, or other sort of relevant content. If you're taking a methods course, for example, you may actually do some sort of live data analysis to get some practice. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, you know, in the um, summer with the online orientation, those first year students will definitely take part in monthly synchronous sessions. They're optional but the cohort lead hosts different topics that we think help prepare students for entering the program. And then um, across the years um, through your cohort lead, there will also be plenty of synchronous sessions um, on various topics, you know, research, writing. Amanda mentioned some of the tech tools. We try to do demos. We also do a lot of sort of cross-pollination with other cohorts. So, you know, when student, Amanda was a student, we may invite her and some of her cohort um, mates to come and talk to new students. So lots of opportunities there. And the, the only one that I would add is we also have um, every single one of the professors are so, so, so willing to be accessible, <clears throat> excuse me, to be accessible um, at a time that is outside of those scheduled synchronous sessions. So especially considering time zones there, I just found across the program, there was so much flexibility to meet with my professors um, and my, my committee, my, my faculty panel um, to meet one-on-one -on -one when needed um, to sort of dive deeper into maybe a question that you're wrestling with in a particular paper or some sort of assignment. There was just a lot of, I, I felt like um, that sort of I, now now we can all relate I think going through COVID but that sense of you know you you realize you get to know somebody very well and then you realize that you've only met them in person maybe once right and that for me having that feeling with classmates as well as professors walking away just showed me that the opportunities that were there really did build that sense of belonging within the program and, and, and of support within the program. Thank you. Next question we have is, can you please share what I would learn in the mind brain teaching track? Yeah, sure. So um, the mind brain teaching track is really an exploration of, you know, what really what it what it sounds like, right? It's it's a dipping your toe into sort of the neuroscience behind learning. Um, what's going on with respect to in your brain, for example, when learning and also we know what we know about how the brain operates and what are the implications for when we're in the classroom. So thinking about uh, practices, um, strategies and things of that nature. So that's really that's really what that um, specialization gets into it. And if you have more questions, um, you know, Tanya, that's something where the the person interested, we could connect them to one of the specialization faculty if we need to. OK, great. Thank you, Dr. Bukowski. Next question we have, what goes into the personal statement besides the POP or is the entire statement the POP? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think, sorry, Tanya, I didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. No, I was just saying that's, I'm assuming that's in the application they're referring to the application essay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah this, this, so this personal statement may be a little bit different than other personal statements you've written, you know, preparing for academic, because it really is focused on um, your research. And, you know, again, going back to the sort of what is the POP. So part of the personal statement is, how does this per, uh, problem or practice show up in my context? What is my context? What does this problem look like in my context? And then also, to the extent that you can via your own reading of the literature or the evidence, as well as your expertise, 
what's the sort of larger view of this problem of practice? In other words, um, you know, what's the motivation for your research? Uh, most likely this problem of practice you're seeing in your context is not just exclusive to your context. We're probably seeing in other places. So what are other researchers, what are other practitioners saying about this? Um, the one thing you might wanna add um, in that problem of practice is how your own experience and expertise and maybe academic training has prepared you to you know, further explore this problem of practice. So, but remember, what you want to avoid in this personal statement is repeating your resume or your CV, because we as a committee, we can read that. So, so you want to try to use that personal statement to tell us something else um, that we wouldn't necessarily learn from that CV. Thank you, Dr. Bukowski. Next question we have, will we receive a copy of this presentation? Yes, all that registered for this presentation today will receive a copy usually within a week of the event. All right, the next question we have is, the person who makes the most sense for me to have as my executive sponsor plans to retire in two and a half years. Can I change midway through the program? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I mean, this person retiring in two and a half years, that potentially, you know, if, if you do get admitted to the program for next fall, Two and a half years might give you the the you know sufficient time to work with this executive sponsor and move your research far enough along that you would be okay. Now I will tell you that you know the program really does work hard to accommodate students, you know, while also honoring the objectives of the program and the rigor and excellence. So we we could of course sort of cross that bridge if we got to it. Um, and I would say that if this person really is the best executive sponsor, then I would go ahead and approach this person if you haven't already. And, you know, just just know that we can sort of figure out the other piece if, if, if you know, you need somebody else at the end. I actually, this is Amanda, I actually had that experience. Um, my executive sponsor did not know at the time of um, filling out my letter of recommendation that she would be retiring, but she committed to that about two and a half years in almost exactly. And so she worked, uh, the program worked with me and she also worked with me to directly communicate with um, the incoming head of school. So she was able to share directly, hey, this is a thing that I committed to on behalf of the institution. And, you know, at my exit, I would like you to continue that. Um, so I think that goes back to what, what Dr. Bukowski was talking about earlier is just really having that relationship with the person um, that you're that you're selecting and, and that they're, they're really in your corner um, because she was able to do all that on her way out, even though she was leaving. Thank you. The next question we have is, can a co-founder of a startup be an executive sponsor? So I'm pausing, Sian, to answer the question. Um, so for me, the role of the person, just, you know, just the, the sort of explicit role of the person is not the focus, is not the determiner for me in terms of executive sponsor. What I would want to know is, relative to the research you want to do, does working with the co-founder co -founder of a startup, you know, again, support you in what you're trying to achieve with respect to your research, which could include needing access to data, needing access to individuals or key stakeholders to, to do that investigation. So I'm less worried about the explicit role or title of a person. I'm more interested in the relative positioning or situation of that person with respect to your goals and research interests. All right, this, the next question we have is, how is work broken out in a typical week during the first two years? Assuming 20 to 25 hours of roughly, how much is asynchronous class time versus reading versus writing assignments versus research? And Amanda, feel free to jump in for this question as well, too. Sure, sure. Um, I think I'll, Carrie, I'll let you start if that's okay. And then I'll just sort of jump in with my experience because I know that's that's very different student to student and, and class to class, course to course. Yeah, I mean, so just to, be, just to clarify, you know, the asynchronous learning is the majority of the work, right? The, the synchronous part, the sort of being together in the same space at the same time 
is is a smaller portion of the work and a lot of it is optional so you can sort of calibrate how much or how little of that synchronous time you want to spend but even if you think about a pie that synchronous time is much smaller than the asynchronous so if we think about the elements of the asynchronous the things that you mentioned um you know again the courses and the research are happening concurrently so for example, one of the requirements of the culminating project is around this literature review of your problem of practice. So some of that research, some of that literature review is embedded in your coursework. So it's sort of you're doing research that will also count as an assignment, which also counts as time doing article reading. So, you know, the 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 courses themselves definitely have a rhythm to them, but the the sort of types of work you do are, are really integrated. And, and Amanda, I, I'll let you sort of add to that. Perfect, perfect. Um, I think for me, uh, the, the integration of the reading and the coursework and ultimately your project or your research was really important because as I said, digitize, 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 many of the assignments that we read, um, I was able to use and as a reference for my ultimately my dissertation work, et cetera. Um, Carrie, also, you also used the word rhythm, and I, I found that each of the courses did really have a rhythm that they followed and that I was therefore able to get myself into one too. So they're broken into sessions. Um, all of the courses are broken into sessions, and each session, give or take, um, one session a semester maybe was about two weeks long. And that really provided us the opportunity to read the literature, reread if needed, that we were reading for that particular week, that particular focus, dive into it, and then have another week to engage with our peers in the class on a discussion board or in synchronous discussions that were sometimes an option instead of writing a response. Um, another week to really engage in what we had just been reading about and to talk about its applicability to our research, connections to other courses. Um, it just, it felt moving through the program, it felt very much like, excuse me, it felt very much like um, the, the, you, you feel the intentionality behind the selections across the syllabi in each of the courses. And so you're able to say, oh, in, you know, my research methods two class, one of the articles that we're reading is done by the same author that I read first semester. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see such and such connection to my research. Um, so there, there is that sort of beat and that rhythm of you have about a week to, to read um, your content and then a week to engage and then we'll move forward to a week of reading. Again, of course, that looks, you know, I, I don't want to generalize too much. I don't want to give the implication that that's a rigid um, approach because each of the courses, you know, a methods class looks very different than, um, you know, one of your specialization classes, for example, but most of them follow that process, yeah. And I guess this is a this is an important time too. Um, I, I found that to, just to that that personable human part, all of the professors in the program recognize that we are working professionals, right? That is the the group of people that are applying to be and and therefore you know those that get into this program are working professionals. And life happens, and we certainly know, especially after the last couple of years, that that can influence timelines. And professors were always very very reasonable. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working with you to, to get done what you need to get done. So there's definitely an air, um, an air of wanting students to succeed um, versus the, you know, do it now or you're out kind of approach that, that some programs can, can give off. So this was very much a, a teamwork, let's help you learn and succeed space. All right, so the next question we have is, I'm curious if you could speak to what motivated the change from a thesis to a doctoral dossier. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. So we as faculty have been working probably for the past six to nine months. And quite honestly, you know, we're getting ready to hit our, I can't believe it, 10 year anniversary as a program. And I mentioned in the beginning that one of the competencies for our students is around improvement sciences and really, you know, collecting data, looking at the data, making improvements, iterations. And so really in the spirit of practicing what we preach, we, we are doing that. Um, we're asking ourselves hard questions. We're looking at data and listening to our students and their experiences. And what we've noticed um, over the years is we would like to offer and have heard from students that we'd like to offer more flexibility, um, more re relevance and more opportunities for students to publish. And so we feel strongly that, you know, the five, the, the traditional five chapter dissertation 
while it offers some benefits to students, um, there's there we feel like there are a lot of sort of untapped opportunities that that will emerge through this dossier and you know the the competencies this this being a critical consumer of research um, improving your academic writing becoming a researcher doing data analysis um, making significant change all of those things will continue in this this new form. It just might look and feel a little differently than sort of the traditional dissertation that you've seen in other programs. And to be quite honest, if you know, one of the things we did as a faculty is we did um, a pretty good scan of the top 10 schools of education, as well as some award winning programs in our sort of market. And there is a diversity of offerings around culminating projects. And we felt like we wanted to be at the lead of that group. And so this is this is what's emerging for us. Thank you. The next question we have is, can you still take the courses in mind, brain, and teaching? Also, please clarify if you specialize in this area and you also specialize in another area. Yeah, so currently, thank you for the question. Currently, um, we ask students to identify a single specialization area and then you take a series of courses in that specialization area. There are opportunities to take a few elective courses so students are able to sort of, you know, move out of that specialization sort of uh, lane, if you will, to explore other interests and potentially other courses that might bolster the research they're doing. But right now, we don't have an opportunity for students to take multiple specializations. And quite frankly, um, there just isn't time in the sequencing. It would, you know, you're already busy with work and courses. So th there just really isn't room room for that sort of um, additional coursework. Thank you. The next question we have is, I haven't been in graduate school for 20 years, so a recommendation from a professor is not a possibility. I believe you already answered this, but just to confirm, the third recommendation could then be another professional reference. Yes, so you can have three professional references um, if you're not able to have that one academic reference. The next question is, are there opportunities to work with the other schools within GHU, specifically the School of Public Health? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, you know, one thing we always encourage our doctoral students to do, and I know it's a little bit di more difficult because it's an online program, is to build your network of faculty. And that may include faculty from the Homewood campus, the engineering or business campus, as well as the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And we as faculty have connections, affiliations, and networks across the university. So the best way to start building that network is to talk to faculty, you know, who serve as your instructors, who you're seeing at various synchronous sessions. For example, I, um, I don't have it anymore, but I used to have a joint appointment at the Bloomberg School and did research with several colleagues over there. So, you know, where possible, I'm happy to make connections and have done so for other students. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. The next question we have is, would it be possible to complete this program from abroad if I'm unable to come to the states for the in-person residency? Yeah, absolutely. Look, we have many, many, many students who are not in the US and are not able to come to the residency. Um, we strongly urge students to come to the residency, uh, particularly our first year students, but it is not a requirement. We would, if so if you were not able to come to an in-person residency uh, first year student as a first year student, we would require you um, to do, there's some, there's some things in addition to the online orientation that you would have to complete, uh, for example, watching some of the recorded face-to-face uh, -face sessions. But no, it, you can definitely still do the program if you're unable to come um, to the U.S. or to Baltimore at any time. Thank you. Next question we have, uh, I think I may have missed this clarification. How important is it that an applicant finalize their problem of practice for the application? I'm excited about the program because of its emphasis on the problem of practice, but not sure if I'm crystal clear on my top choice for problem of practice to study now. Ah, oh, that is that is such a good that is such a good question, and I will be honest with you. So I was um, I was a doctoral student in the first uh, cohort of this program, and a few years ago I went back and read my personal statement 
for the program. And oh my goodness, <laughs> how my POP evolved. So one of the things we tell our students from day one is that this is an iteration, that that problem of practice will evolve. You will get to a point where you are satisfied with it. You have the evidence to support it. You will collect the data for it. And even, I know, I know you don't wanna hear this, but even after you complete your culminating project and get that degree, you will go back and realize you wanna do more on it. So it, it really is, right now. <laughs> yeah, it really is always a work in progress. So don't, you know, it won't be complete when you write that personal statement. It, and and uh, something, something that I wanna highlight there too, is that the reason why it's changing is because you are, the program is doing its job. And so that's, that's what I meant when I said to trust the professors and the process. So once, once you start to learn a little bit more about each of the, the areas that may be contributing to your problem of practice, once you learn a little bit more about improvement science, then you start to really understand what's happening with your problem. And then the language, the iteration, the versions will change. Mine started out very much focused on belonging at the class level and then the more I realized which factors are really influencing belonging within my problem of practice it started to change much more to the culturally responsive teaching and, and pedagogy methodology so it, it will change your your heart and your love and your interests will still be in it but a lot of the language around it will change um, and you'll get to the place where your computer is filled with POP iteration one two three four just all the way up so <laughs> don't feel pressure to have a, a perfectly shiny POP when you apply. Thank you so much. Okay, here you'll see some important contact information on this slide, information for myself, Tanya McMillan, the admissions coordinator for the EDD program, and of course, Dr. Bukowski and uh, my colleague, Kathy Chow, academic program coordinator. Please feel free, I know we didn't get to all questions today, to email your questions to us accordingly that we may have not had time to answer since we are at 5.01 p.m. We will have to complete our webinar today. I'd like to thank both Amanda and Dr. Bukowski so much for joining us today and also all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Yeah, thanks, Sion, Tanya, Amanda. It was, it was great to see everybody and thanks everybody for attending. <laughs>